Hello, and welcome to today's tutorial. Today we should be painting the Protectorate of Minos Knights Exemplar by Fabriteer Press. My goals for this project were to create aesthetic models that were on the higher end of tabletop quality, but not spend so much time at completing the 3 or 40 squads and create burnout on my part. We begin with the dark grey primer. I like using this color as it makes it easier to shade up to a white for the pre-shading process and doesn't make the recesses so dark that the actual color codes are lost in the shadows. As you can see, I use old sprues to mount the various bits from the kit. I do not like holding the pieces directly, and I think this is a good use for what would otherwise be trash. I did make several mistakes in mounting these on the sprues though. As I caught early on, I forgot to put handles on the pieces and mounted them too close together, most notably with the arms. I cut the arm sprues in half to help alleviate this issue, but as we'll see later on, they caused some hindrance with the detailing of the arm sprues. A third mistake did not catch till the very end of the project is that I use a cyanocrylate glue. This is a very strong super glue that bonds pretty much everything together very tightly. Usually for mounting bits to sprues, I use Tester's model glue which works okay at best, and it's not nearly as strong as cyanocrylate. After priming, move to a medium gray for pre-shading. The lighting makes it disappear is much lighter than it actually is in real life. It's difficult to see in the camera angles, but I hang the model at an angle that's just slightly above perpendicular. This will leave the dark gray primer only on the underside of the model. Unfortunately, my camera ran at uh, battery power when I did the apex school white to finish out the pre-shading process. What this is done with simply spraying white primer almost directly down from the top of the model to help highlight was not covered by the medium gray and dark grays. Begin my first color shade with Rust. This is a reddish brown and works great for pulling a bright red into a believable looking shadow tone. I spray this at an upward angle, trying to keep the paint in the lower parts and recesses of the model. With the pre-shading, the Rust color tends to overlap between the dark gray and medium gray areas. As lighter shades of red are applied, this will create a nice silky smooth transition between a bright highlight of red and a dark shaded fold of the cloth.
Our true base color is fire red. Like the medium grays from the step before this, this is applied at an angle that's just above perpendicular to the model. I'm not really worried about the pink parts of the cloth at this stage because we'll come back with another lighter shade of red, which will saturate that hue into a more true red tone. Our final color in this crimson triad is Ferrari Red for highlight. This is a red which is light in color, but does not manage to look pink once it's fully saturated. I place a near vertical angle to the model to ensure that it saturates all the pink looking areas from the fire red in the previous step. Since I do not have a creamy white color, I made my own by mixing white and wood colors in 4 to 1 ratio. I then thinned down this mixture with about a 2 to 1 ratio of paint to airbrush thinner on my wet palette. This ensured that I would not be leaving any brush strokes behind because of how thin the paint was when I applied it. I find the colors such as white make paints uh, and brush lines very obvious when I apply them to a model. One of the drawbacks to doing the paint this thin, especially on a wet palette, that takes four or five layers of paint to cover up any overspray than the previous red la layers. Next, I use nice iron-looking paint applied to all the plate armor underneath decorative white armor. 
I like this color in particular because when it's washed later on, it looks like a real iron piece. As you notice with the legs, there are a few parts in the models in which the cloth and plate armor have no really definitive edge between the two. I just picked out a flowing line which made biolog biological sense for the shape of quadriceps or gastrocnemius and paint out the thighs and calves on the mini. I varied up my painting flow for this project, and matte coated the model before painting the shiny metal beds. This was done to ensure that the previous painted bits wouldn't be ruined by mistake cleanups in, in the next few steps, as well as giving it some protection as I wouldn't be doing any further real protective coats to the project in the name of contrasting the shiny with dull surfaces. The 
step is slightly out of sequence. Originally, I was intending to mimic a really cool effect of polished steel by base coating the blades in black and edge line them in white before applying a very thin coat of silver. Unfortunately, my edge line technique is terrible and needs some more practice. For this project, I wound up just paying up a very thick layer of silver to cover up my undercoating mistakes. I will continue to practice with the edge line technique and I hope to be able to apply this technique to the final piece and not to this in the future. For the shiny metal bits, I began with the liquid metals from Vallejo. These are fantastic. Since they are alcohol based, I had to swap my wet palette for more traditional plastic palette so I could add more alcohol as the paint dried up. Being alcohol based does have a pros and cons. On the plus side, it flows extremely well, coats very smooth without any brush strokes and usually takes only one, maybe two coats of paint to actually fully coat and saturate a piece. On the downside, it does dry up very quickly. For detailed parts such as this, you have to add more alcohol to your palette because it will dry up before you have finished using what you poured out. You should also dedicate a set of brushes to these paints as well, since getting water in the paint will cause it to rust, which for most projects, this one in particular, is a very undesirable effect. This copper color is like painting with liquid pennies. With a wash, it transitions very easily into a bronze color, which is very appropriate for a steampunk themed game such as War Machine. It's a very realistic color and looks identical to the gold you'd see in unpolished jewelry. 
With the wash, it looks old and worn, but still retains a very expensive shiny gold appeal. One of my disappointments with this unit is that the squad leader is very plain and can be easily missed amongst the rest of the squad. Typically War Machine squad leaders have some kind of excessively flamboyant bits on them, but here in particular, they have just a mildly different hat. I decided to paint some triangle patterns on the base of the squad leader's cloak to help easily just differentiate him from the rest of his squad mates. This turned out well, but I'd like to experiment more with freehand decorations on cloth as I have some extravagant ideas for other units with billowing robes and tunics, which requires a greater skill point possessed currently. For the leather bits on the gauntlets and belts, I used a dark brown and highlighted with a yellowish brown where I thought the light would catch the leather pieces. As you can see here, I hide the lower part of the belt instead of the upper part where people usually have light hitting it. Because of how the top of the cloak billows out above the belt, I figured light be hitting the lower part of the belt more than the upper part, therefore making it want to highlight it more on the bottom than the top. For this project, I decided to apply the metal wash without gloss coating first. This is because I didn't want the metal to appear dull with the reversing matte coat after the wash. 
This decision resulted in me needing to be much more precise and accurate with the wash than I typically am, and so the wash step took me several hours to complete all on its own. After the wash is complete, it's time for assembly. If you may recall, I mentioned using cyanoacrylic instead of bottle glue to mount the bits of sprues. I did not realize this until it came to the final assembly step, and nearly broke off some of the bits trying to remove them from the sprues. As a result, I had to cut off the arms from the sprue, and subsequently cut off the nubs the arms were supposed to mount onto, and instead just glue them flat onto the torso. I decided to include this bit in here because it shows me really struggling with basically trying to unscrew up my mistake. In the end, it shows that good planning results in a much smoother workflow throughout your entire project.
And there you have it, the completed squad. Overall, this project took me about six hours of painting time. I think that if I had been doing just a single model instead of six models, it probably would take me still around four hours to complete. So an additional two hours on an assembly line time scale isn't all that bad. Still, most pe people run four to six of these squads in any army, which comes out to cost me 24 to 36 hours of paint time. That's enough to cause me burnout. Overall, I'm happy with the end result. I think that the red cloth really looks realistic in its highlights and shadows. But I do think my workflow could have been a little bit better in terms of sequential events. I probably could have not done in about four hours total time had I had a little better planning on my part. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, and share.